M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 151 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. Allison, I have no idea how we're going to get to all the week's news in one show, but we'll give it a go. Today, we'll be covering the New York Attorney General's $250 million civil fraud trial, including the fact that both, shockingly, Eric and Donald backed out of testifying at the last minute, and that the appeals court in New York reinstated the gag order from Judge Ingeron. We'll also cover the Hunter Biden motion for Rule 17B subpoenas and the new indictment against him. Yep, yep. Plus, we have updates on Fulton County, including the nearly 200-person potential witness list and the Chesbro Cooperation Tour. He's on tour uh, and he's now cooperating in four investigations. Um, and we'll talk about uh, updates on the, the Rudy defamation trial. And um, if we have time, we'll get to keeping Trump off the ballot under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, but those updates are pretty much up to date. And if we don't get to it, we'll definitely cover uh, the, the progress on the next episode. Uh, and also, this is very cool. We're going to be joined later by former Pence advisor Olivia Troy, who recently testified before Jim Jordan's Weaponization Committee. And by the way, she will be joining us in D.C. on April 20th for our MSW Media Meetup for patrons. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, if you know anybody or want to sign up to be a patron so you can get a chance to RSVP to that, you can do that at patreon.com slash aisle45pod, A-I-S-L-E 45-P-O-D. And speaking of patrons, we have some new patrons to thank with St. Janet, some Wyoming rando, love it, Captain Hawkeye, ooh, Christopher Myatt, Michael Gratan, and Erica. So thank you so much for being patrons. You make the show work. Uh, all right, um, let's head to New York uh, because we've got a lot to cover there. The court was dark on Monday because Donald backed out of testifying at the 11th hour. And this goes along with Eric Trump backing out of testifying. Now, they both initially testified for the for the case put on by the prosecution, but did not go back up on the stand for the defense. Why do you why do you think that was, Pete? I think they had no good reason to do so. One, I mean, I think Trump wanted to have some ability to complain about things when he when the New York uh, appellate court upheld the gag order. It limited what he could say. And I think there wasn't a lot that he was going to add to the defense. And again, remember, even though the defense might call him, he gets to be cross-examined by the prosecution again. So given the things that have come out, I don't see any good reason. And like everything Trump does, you know, oh, I'm going to cooperate and talk to Mueller. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, it's all BS. And so it doesn't surprise me much. I think there was a whole lot of downside and not a lot of upside. I mean, he can go have his little impromptu, you know, media speeches as he walks in and out of the courtroom. I don't think it would do him much good to go up on the stand. And Eric, same thing. I think the prospect of Eric getting cross-examined uh, would do a lot of potential harm. And I don't see a lot of upside in how it would help their case. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking as well. And it, and it seemed like, you know, Trump was trying to get that gag order stay uh, put back on quickly so that he could, I guess, testify about specifically the law clerk in the courtroom uh, on Monday, because I think that that was probably maybe his, you know, main defense. They all they filed a motion about it, right? Like, 
He's trying to say that the whole trial is bogus because the law clerk who s- slips notes and whispers to Judge Angoron um, is a Democrat and gave to a Democrat, you know, who was running for office somewhere in New York and and therefore it's all biased and should all be thrown out. And I think that's what he wanted to testify to. But because of the gag order being in place, uh, he 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 really couldn't. And so it, you're right. It just didn't benefit him at all. But speaking of that, the reason that the gag order wasn't I mean, it still would have, I think, be been reinstated. But apparently Trump's lawyers rushed to try to appeal this and have it heard by the Wednesday before Trump was set to testify, but got there too late. Uh, mean, and oh, so Alina Haba did a bad law thing. I'm shocked. <laughs> shocked that could possibly have happened. <laughs> and so that kind of I don't think they would have granted it anyway, but that sort of screwed it up. He wanted it to be heard that Wednesday. And and the the, the court said, no, um, this has to be heard by a panel, which means that the AG gets a chance to respond and she'll get until Monday to respond. And so that just sort of meant that the gag order is going to kind of be in place until the end of these proceedings. And I shouldn't say the total end of the proceedings because the actual closing arguments are set for January 11th still. Um, uh, but the court is dark. He was supposed to be testifying today uh, and he was not, but he did show up for something, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. So <laughs> we had, and you know, Eric Trump, as we mentioned, was supposed to take the stand, but he too backed out. And instead, we got testimony from an expert witness. That, get this: Trump paid over eight hundred thousand uh, dollars, and this came out during the uh, cross examination of the expert. But get this: part of the payment didn't come from Trump or the Trump Organization, but it came from Trump's Save America PAC. This is from CBS News. Former President Donald Trump sat attentively in the courtroom of his New York civil fraud trial on Thursday, watching as the defense's final expert witness, Eli Bartov, proclaimed that there was, quote, no evidence whatsoever of any accounting fraud, unquote, which, you know, it, it to, if, if you're going to pay somebody over $800,000, I sure as hell hope they're going to say something uh, as, <laughs> as much nonsense as it is, uh, would say something that unequivocal, but it's, it's all BS, right? Yeah. And I mean, generally each side pays for their own expert witness, right? And I don't think there's anything illegal with paying him part from the Trump org, part from the Save America PAC. I don't think, but it, there could be, that could be considered a personal expense. I'm not sure. I don't know the legal ins and outs of that, but it's usually not close to a million dollars, right? And I was wondering, like, why is Trump there? Everyone was sort of surprised that morning. Like, Trump's here. Why is Trump here? Why is Trump here? It's because he paid nearly a million bucks for this guy. I wanted to see what he was paying for. This is more from ABC. On Friday, Bartoff revealed he was uh, that he made approximately $877,500 for his expert testimony in the case, charging $1,350 an hour for about 650 hours of work. 650 hours? Okay. It's when what, questioned 12, by 12-ish <laughs> weeks? I mean, that's a long, that's a long time. <laughs> now, when questioned by lawyers for the state of New York about who was paying him, like you said, Bartoff replied his bank statement showed some of the money was paid by the Trump org and some came from the Save America PAC. Um, and the, the state's attorney during the cross expressed skepticism about Bartoff's findings, to put it mildly. Uh, leading to some heated moments in the courtroom. Quote, this is pure speculation, the AG said, uh, the AG's office said, this is pure speculation from someone that they've hired to say just whatever it is they want in this case. That's Kevin Wallace, a lawyer for the state attorney general during an objection to Bartov's testimony. Trump's attorney, Suarez, replied, oh, that's nasty, man. And then Wallace said, it is. <laughs> and, they, you know, and, they, and they went back, they had a little, they got into it. Because like I said, it is normal for each side to pay for their own experts, but this is an exceedingly huge pile of cash for this guy. And I'm assuming he was paid up front because Trump notoriously doesn't pay his bills. And, you know, it also made me think of that whole Weisselberg Trump org severance package where he got $2 million, but most of it wasn't payable until after he got out of jail, after he testified here, after he testified there, after these depositions, like little chunks at a time. Like, you'll get this based on how you do and what you say and if you sit in jail for 100 days for me. It seems like a little awkward. It would really be kind of impossible to prove that there's a quid pro quo there. But, you know, it we know there is. 
Yeah. And look, every expert's going to do that. I mean, whoever's hiring the expert is hiring them because they have some expectation that they're going to give them information or, you know, a data point, a claim data point that they want. But what gets me is not, again, this is not, we've talked about this again, and it just irritates the hell out of me. This isn't Trump paying for this. This isn't his real estate acumen that he's, you know, pulling some of the profits to pay for this expert $1,300 an hour. It's coming in, you know, some portion of it out of a Save America pack, which means, guess what? Mom and pop outside of Cleveland, Ohio, mom and pop in rural Mississippi, mom and pop somewhere in South Carolina who went to a rally and signed up to give $5 a month. They're the ones paying this expert a million dollars to get up there and talk about how, you know, whatever it is that Trump wants to hear. Trump, who flies into New York on his own 757, who then goes and stays in his gilded apartment in just off the uh, Central Park. He can't pay for it. What he's going to use instead are each and every one of these people who probably pay more in federal income taxes than Donald Trump does, but nevertheless relying on their donations to finance his defense in this trial. So he's not even paying for it. He's, he's relying on people who somehow decide that Donald Trump is the greatest thing for America and their money that they're giving to presumably try and get him back in the White House is getting diverted instead to pay for this criminal defense work or, or civil defense work. It's obscene. And it's not, it's not like Trump is scraping by, right? It's not like some GoFundMe because I've got some horrible, you know, sickness that I can't pay the bills for, or I've been wrongly accused and I need to fund my, you know, defense team because I have no other way to do it. Donald Trump has plenty of ways to pay for this. But what's he doing mm -hmm. instead? Let's go, let's go to all my supporters and their $5 donation. I'm going to take, you know, a couple of bucks out of that and pay this guy almost a million dollars. Yeah. It, it just in, infuriates me and nobody will say that nobody, you know, whether or not people care, I, there might be a good chunk of folks who probably would give money anyway, but I would guarantee you a lot of these donors think, yeah, I'm giving money so that Trump will get reelected, not I'm writing a check for the civil defense fund for Donald right, Trump. Right. Like they think they're paying experts. for like foam hats and banners and, you know, campaign stuff. No, no, you're nope. not. You're, nope. You're paying Eli Bartov, fees. Eli Bartov, the $877,000 <laughs> man. All right. We have a lot more news to get to. We're going to talk about Hunter Biden, but we have to take a quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. We have more patrons to thank. Annie Harmon, Jeff Moss, Just Call Me E, who joined for extra Pete swearing, and to ask Allison to follow me so I can respond to posts, <laughs> David or Dave H., Tortured Orchard, and Rebecca Patton. Thank all of you so much. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being part of the team. We simply just could not do this without you. And so uh, both of our thanks to all of you for your support of the show. So let's now go up to Delaware, where special counsel David Weiss found a nine count indictment against Hunter Biden after five years of investigation for tax evasion and filing false tax returns. It includes three felonies and six misdemeanors. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you think. I mean, this was, uh, I guess, not entirely a surprise, but what is interesting is that, you know, we were close to a plea deal where Hunter Biden would have uh, accepted uh, a plea without any jail time. And now to see this is uh, kind of surprising to see it come back with such a heavy hammer. Yeah, I thought so too, because generally the DOJ doesn't take a bunch of felonies and offer you a misdemeanor. They'll like take a bunch of felonies and offer you one felony and then, you know, you can plead out that way. But now he went from misdemeanors to felonies. I have I, I I haven't seen that really a lot in at least in the cases I've been looking at in the last five years, um, uh, revolving around uh, Trump world. But he filed these in in what like the Central District of California, I think. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, and it's for tax years from like 2016 to 2021. Uh, but, but he paid all these back. He paid these taxes back. Um, and we've seen most of the cases I see for this kind of tax evasion in Trump world, for example, Rudy Giuliani owes $550,000 in back taxes. They didn't indict him. They just put liens on his properties. Uh, Roger Stone owed $2 million in back taxes. 
And they didn't indict him. They just sued him. And he's now finally paying. So it's going to be, I think, kind of difficult to show that this is not vindictive and selective prosecution. But I mean, it's th- that's also an uphill climb showing vindictive and selective prosecution. So we're kind of in a in this weird scenario where, you know, because the argument against vindictive and selective prosecution is Merrick Garland is the attorney general. He was appointed by this guy's dad, you know, even though this is a holdover, this is a, a leftover guy that Barr appointed five years ago with Trump and Barr and uh, that he's, you know, uh, you know, on the on the scale of Durham to Smith, he's way down on the Durham end. Um, but I was also interested in your thoughts about all of the extra kind of things that were put in this indictment that didn't necessarily need to be there. There's a speaking indictment. They talked a lot about his extravagant lifestyle. They talk a lot about his uh, the things he was spending money on instead of paying his taxes. They spoke a lot about his work with China, his work with Burisma, which, and none of that has anything to do with whether or not he paid taxes. But we also saw this in the Manafort case, right? Prosecutors in the Manafort case wanted to bring in the ostrich jacket and the boots and the suits and everything he bought and show his extravagant lifestyle. And the judge in that case, I think it was Sullivan, um, he was like, he's like, I'm not going to bar it uh, pursuant to a motion in limine. Like, I'm not going to bar it, but watch your step. And then during the trial, when the prosecutors brought up this extravagant lifestyle Manafort was leading, the judge was like, all right, enough. You know what? Enough. I, it's, you know, we're not talking about his extravagant lifestyle. We're talking about whether he signed his name to a false filing or whether he failed to pay these taxes. And I think we're going to find ourselves in the same boat here. Yeah, there's a lot that I have questions about. And the first observation is there's a lot we don't know, right? We don't know what the discussions have been behind the scenes uh, about trying to work out a plea deal. We don't know what uh, discovery has looked like and what things the government has in its possession and might use at trial and what things that uh, Abby Lowell and uh, Hunter Biden have. Abby Lowell has a you know a reputation of being a little bit of a pugilist. I think you know some people question whether or not he you know was Hunter getting good advice about deciding to fight this or not. I, you know we'll see. I, I think as laid out, I mean there is certainly evidence of alleged evidence of violations of the law. But as you point out, it's like okay if you're gonna if you're gonna prosecute this violation of the law, and I tend to be all for prosecuting violations of the law that are pretty clear cut, that's fine, but do it consistently. And you know, the yeah. fact of the matter is I think you can draw a lot of parallels to people who engaged in more egregious behavior who weren't prosecuted. And were Hunter Biden's or were Hunter's last name not Biden? I really would be, you know, it would not surprise me at all if this went completely uncharged. And so the question becomes, you know, can they make that point with sufficient, you know, credibility and persuasiveness to sustain a selective uh, prosecution claim? Can they sit there? The minute you start talking about Burisma and everything, you know, you start opening yourself up to you can't detach Rudy from all of this because Rudy was in the middle of running around Ukraine trying to get information on Burisma and how. Hunter Biden and Abby Lowell can leverage what Rudy did, I think is going to be very interesting. There's a significant amount of you know indication that Hunter didn't necessarily have control over his electronic devices, you know, particularly when he was going through you know some of the lowest points of his addiction, people taking his electronic devices, hacking into his account. And so there's some question in my mind if the government tries to assert that certain transactions were done by Hunter, I I think you could make a pretty strong argument that, you know, a bunch of people had access to Hunter Biden's Venmo account and email and iCloud accounts, and not just him, and trying to Mm -hmm. prove that it was him that, you know, he was sober when he engaged in certain things. It's going to present a challenge. And I'm curious to see how the government responds to that. And and, and you're right. I, I think there was a certain element reading it. It's like, come on, this is this is like reading some of the gratuitous detail that that Durham threw into the sus. Sussman and Danchenko. It's like, why why are you doing this? This stuff doesn't relate to Hunter Biden. This is all part of the Joe Biden Ukraine narrative. And that's why it's in there, not talking about the tax crime, yeah. allegedly, that Hunter Biden engaged in. Then Hunter Biden wants that information, right? Because last week, uh, Hunter, uh, Hunter Biden's lawyer, as we said, Abby Lowell, um, he filed a motion for subpoenas under Rule 17B. He says, 
um, I want to subpoena um, Rosen, who is the former acting attorney general, Donahue, former deputy acting attorney general, uh, and Barr and Trump. And those are yeah, I want to get information from them. Now, David Weiss responded to this motion for subpoenas as though he were responding to a motion to dismiss for selective and vindictive prosecution because he went on for dozens of pages, but 30 plus pages arguing against a vindictive and selective prosecution. He only spent a couple paragraphs on the 17B subpoena um, part of the motion, which is the whole motion. And what's interesting about that is that motions for pretrial, pretrial motions to dismiss aren't due until today, Monday, as we record this. Um, and so now Abby Lowell goes into filing a motion for selective and vindictive prosecution, knowing David Weiss's entire defense against it. He's like, he's like really well prepared now to file a very well crafted um, motion to dismiss on based on selective uh, or vindictive prosecution. And something else that happened um, it just now, as you and I are recording, we have some breaking news. There is another, they did file a motion to dismiss. Uh, we don't have the one for vindictive and select, selective prosecution yet. I'm assuming there's going to be a handful of these motions to dismiss. But they did file one saying that Biden's uh, Biden is filing a motion to dismiss the indictment because special counsel Weiss was unlawfully appointed and this prosecution violates the appropriations clause. And I have to say, I don't think this is going anywhere. These similar motions were filed in the Mueller investigation. Weiss is arguing that because David Weiss is paid out of a permanent fund at the U.S. Treasury, um, he, he can't be special counsel because he was uh, in the government at the time he was appointed and it's supposed to be from outside the government. But a, a different rule makes that OK uh, under the under the regs. And this just this seems like um, something that perhaps, you know, a, a, a place marker for appeal or just something that we expected to see. But I imagine that this will be outright denied because I have to say, I do believe David Weiss has authority to be appointed special counsel and act as special counsel. And he wasn't appointed special counsel until Attorney General Garland appointed him special counsel. Anyway, so it's going to be a tough, I think that's this this particular motion I'm, I'm, I think will be denied. Yeah. And it's interesting because this is all breaking as we're taping. It looks like now there are three different motions that uh, Hunter Biden has filed. The first is the uh, unlawful appointment. There's a second motion uh, to dismiss the indictment for failure to charge a constitutionally permissible offense. And this is the second uh, Second Amendment argument that 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 law that he was charged with has been ruled unconstitutional. And then there's a third uh, motion that was just filed, 69 pages, uh, Mr. Biden's motion to dismiss for selective and vindictive prosecution in breach of separation of powers. So again, literally, this is getting filed as we're <laughs> taping, uh, won't be able to go through and uh, digest it. And I agree with you. I mean, the first one, I think, is a long shot. But I think the second one, the the uh, gun crime, I think, has a very good chance of having those uh crimes tossed. And we'll have to sit and chew through the 70 pages, 69 pages of the uh, selective and vindictive prosecution argument to see uh, to see what it is they're arguing. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the good news is they had the benefit of seeing because of uh, what David Weiss filed, essentially seeing what the government is going to make as their argument. And that's hugely helpful. I mean, you, anybody who's been through any sort of legal proceedings, if you can sort of see the contours of what the other side is going to argue before you file your argument, it's enormously mm -hmm. helpful. So uh, I'm sure, you know, any number of people right now are reading through it, uh, attorneys who can sort of go through and see how they responded to what Weiss put in his uh, in his filing. But, you know, more to come soon. Yeah, and we will definitely um, read through these. It's a long one. Whew, it's uh, it's definitely the, the vindictive selective prosecution was. We're going to read through this. We're going to parse it out, and we're going to discuss them in depth on next week's Clean Up on L45 because they're, like you said, Pete, just now dropping in the docket. Um, and uh, you know, I don't I don't know that we necessarily will need to cover the one uh, that uh, David Weiss is not. Uh, uh, authorized to be a special counsel. Um, but I'll read through it. And if there's something that pops up that wasn't, that's a novel argument that wasn't made already in the Mueller investigation and already in the Jack Smith uh, investigation and, and pretty much every special counsel investigation that's happened since the regs changed in 99, I'll, you know, I'll let you know um, if there's something novel in there. But I doubt, th I doubt there is. This is like one of those boilerplate things that you file uh, when you're being indicted by a special prosecutor. 
um, since 99. Uh, all right. Um, what, do we have anything <laughs> else see, on the- Yeah, it, everything is breaking. I mean, this is the result of like after everybody sort of kicking all of these cans down the road, we're coming to a point where you can't kick them down the road anymore. <laughs> and you're, you're seeing everything at once. And in fact, you know, same as we're taping right now on Monday, guess what? Um, the Ruby Freeman and Shamos defamation suit is underway in Washington, D.C. with Judge Beryl Howell presiding. Jury's been in panel. They went through voir dire this morning. They uh, selected the jury and the trial has begun. Rudy even showed up. Now, granted, he was 20, 30 minutes late because Rudy, you, you would think after missing a pretrial event last week that he was supposed to show up for and his attorney fell on his sword in front of Judge Howell saying, no, it's my fault that he wasn't here. After that sort of warning, you would think you'd get your ass to jail or to uh, the court on time. But no, not Rudy. He claimed that, well, you know, the lines, the security lines were so long. Also a thing that you would hope your attorney might caution you <laughs> talking to any single person who has ever been to the Prettyman courthouse to understand that. That 8.30, 9.30 time frame, the lines go out the door and it takes some time. So dumbass, show up at 8, 8.30, but not Rudy. Rudy, you know, waltzes in and what I saw, you know, reporting that a visibly irritated Judge Howell noted that uh, Rudy was late. Now, interestingly enough, we're we're in opening, uh, we're in opening statements right now. And his, uh, his attorney, Giuliani's attorney, just told a D.C. jury that the Georgia election workers he defamed are asking for, quote, the civil equivalent of the death penalty, unquote. Mm. And that if the judge imposes damages high enough, quote, or if the jury imposes damages high enough, quote, it would be the end of Mr. Giuliani. I I just, I I can't go, yeah, so sad, too bad. You know, great. So he will be, you know, again, in, in prison, not a lot of use for all that money, but I don't cannot imagine how I wouldn't make that argument to the jury. Isn't that something you should have thought about before you engaged in this defamatory behavior? Or before you refused to hand over discovery. If you were really worried about being the end of Mr. Giuliani, that Mr. Giuliani might want to consider adhering to the rules of discovery that every other American citizen has to uh, abide by. Isn't that something that when you're sitting there defaming these poor poll workers that maybe and ruining their lives and having them, you know, threatened and terrified and afraid to go out in public, maybe you would consider the ramifications of your actions before you engage in them. But no, I don't need to show up at court. No. I don't need to show up at court on time. I don't, oh my gosh, I did this. If you, if you give them what they're asking for, it will be the end of him. Because there are well, no consequences for Rudy well, Giuliani. None. The thing, and this is what I would argue. I'd be like, look, it would have cost you maybe $350,000 to comport with discovery. And Trump paid that bill, but you didn't hand anything over. And so now you're basically saying that whatever I have is worth holding on to, whatever the, whatever the price. So we're going to give you whatever that price is, sir. And, I mean, and the thing is, and, and what? So this this privileged white man... Who has already been found, and 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 they they listen, you know how he's already been found. The default judgment of defaming them—that's settled. This is all about damages. Yeah. So this entitled white man who can't even show up on time for this trial, having ruined the lives of these black women, to sit there and try and tell the jury, "Oh my goodness, if you give them what they want, it's going to be the end of him." Well, how how does that how does that just not he already is clearly an entitled white man unaccustomed to ever facing consequences of any sort? How does this not I, I don't understand how that argument it strikes me as horrible, politically absolutely tone deaf, and likely to backfire. Yeah. It will. He, he will. deserves and- the civil look. Given what he has been found guilty of, he deserves the civil equivalent of the death penalty. Yeah, and he and he lied about what his assets are. Nobody can even know. Um so I mean he you know he's going to be sitting there like, "Hey, I only have two turntables and a microphone. You should only give him one turntable." I mean, cuz that's all I got. You know, no, no, you're hiding your assets and and the jury is allowed to infer that you're hiding your assets. Um there so they took after those opening statements they took a, a lunch break. They came back, and just a few minutes ago, 
Um, and I'm reading from Zoe Tillman's Twitter here. The plaintiff's fir- first witness, and this is Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss's first witness, is Regina Scott, an investigator who did social media monitoring and analysis about the mentions of Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss uh, and content of the posts. They found 710,000 mentions by name between November 20th and uh, May of 2023. Uh, November of 2020 and May of 2023. 318,000 mentions. Uh, in a in a smaller time frame, just in the from May to August of 2023, just a three month period, 318,000. Um, and then the jury heard that Scott, uh, this is Regina Scott, found more than 320,000 mentions of Freeman and Moss by name between August 18th of this year and November 22nd of this year. Another 320,000 mention. Mentions, and then they hear evidence of of Giuliani continuing to bring them up in publicly in public commentary between just this past summer and now. So this is kind of where they're starting uh, with the plaintiffs. And Giuliani's lawyer on cross uh, probes the reliability of that data, which is his job um, about the mentions of Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, um, and and asks about the credibility of the team that did the work. And asked if the and the person who did the analysis, Regina Scott, if the spreadsheet collecting all the posts shows how their how the poster learned about the info they were discussing. So maybe it's like, oh, maybe they didn't learn about it from Rudy. She says no. Uh, so that's that's the battle that's going on here on the first day. And this trial is only supposed to last about two to four or five days, right, Pete? Yeah, and I we'll see. I mean, they it looks like they're done for the day, and the that witness is done. So you know, the curious thing will be, you know, who, if anybody, does the defense offer uh, as a witness? You know, whether or not Rudy will take the stand or not. But I think it, you know, there's a decent chance that by the time we, uh, you know, do the bonus episode at the end of the week, we'll have a uh, at least the matter have will have gone to the jury how fast they take to deliberate and come up with the uh, you know dollar figures i don't know but i think it's uh not expected to be much more than a week we have a lot more to cover in this show but we have to take a quick break everybody stick around we'll be right back Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, We have more patrons to thank, including, insert turkey pun here, Jason Adams, Karen Murphy, Liz Smeckle, rhymes with freckle, Renee Miller, and Crow Woman. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I have to tell you, supporting independent media is supporting democracy. So thank you very much for your contributions. We really appreciate it. You make the show happen. We couldn't do it without you. All right, everybody, let's head to Fulton County. And first up, the cheese. Pete, the cheese is on tour. The cheese has returned to Wisconsin. He's on a roll. Those are the headlines. Um, And he's now cooperating with four state investigations into fraudulent electors, including Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada. And now new reporting from CNN and exclusive shows that he traveled to Arizona this past Monday to speak with prosecutors there. So all eyes on Arizona. Pete, I was surprised Nevada went before Arizona indicting their fraudulent electors. I thought Arizona would go first, but Nevada has been investigating for a much longer time than Arizona because the attorney general didn't get there in Arizona till this past January, and they put together the uh, investigation uh, for the the prosecution team in May. So it's a newer investigation, but he's there. Um, And we know electors have already been indicted in Georgia, obviously Fulton County, Michigan, and now Nevada. And I expect Arizona, maybe Wisconsin to follow. I don't know in which order. But he is out there and his lawyer has said, look, he is he's agreed to cooperate in these investigations to avoid going to jail, just like he did in Fulton County. But the one place that's missing so far, Pete, is D.C. We know he asked for permission to travel there, but that's the one place we haven't gotten any news that he's helping out or cooperating. Doesn't mean he's not, but it's they're very quiet up there in D.C. Yeah, they are. And look, I mean, the reason we know about this is because I think the uh it's coming from Chesborough's attorneys. I mean, a couple of things. One, this is the first time we heard about Wisconsin, that Wisconsin is investigating. So that's a big deal. Uh, you know, Nevada has been out there. Uh, certainly Arizona has been out there. Michigan, we've talked, Michigan has charged a number of people, but now guess what? You know, Wisconsin's looking at it too. So this is getting bigger. And in my opinion, I cannot envision a scenario where Chesborough is going out and cooperating in all these places and has not had, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, or well, I'm not sure, but I believe he has likely been in front of the grand jury with Jack Smith. But to 
to have all of these cooperation uh, deals or arrangements in place and not to be cooperating with the feds uh, would really, really surprise me. So I know I'm just surprised his lawyer hasn't come out and said we're cooperating with the feds, too. Like I and and, I mean, what is there something in the Department of Justice? Because the. They're allowed to talk about their cooperation if they want, but I have seen some DOJ subpoenas that say, please don't. Um, is there a way that the DOJ can force somebody to not talk about their cooperation and say that, you know, you might not get it if you do? Like, what? I don't know the law there. I mean, you can put, so look, I mean, there, is some, there, there are differences in, if you are subpoenaed to the grand jury, if you are subpoenaed for records uh, before the grand jury, that's something that as the person who receives that subpoena or testifies in front of the grand jury, you're absolutely allowed to leave and talk about it. The the grand jurors are, you know, are bound to secrecy. The government is bound to secrecy. But that's different. If you're working out a cooperation agreement, you can put anything in there, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, demanding that if you want this cooperation agreement, you're, you're not going to talk about it and think about it in this way, right? If you have somebody who is engaged, at, you know, say an organized crime and they are at a lower level, they're cooperating against somebody who's higher up and maybe they're known and it's public that uh, something has occurred, but maybe the crime is still ongoing. So you can get a cooperation agreement where somebody agrees to wear a wire, where somebody agrees to come in and testify and you can you know agree to be bound to secrecy you know the government it, it, that that's part of the reason it's an agreement right it's not a compulsory sort of thing like the grand jury it would be an agreement so it is possible that the government would say hey look you know yes we want you to cooperate here the you know come in for queen for a day we're going to give you immunity and hear what you might uh provide testimony wise cooperation wise they may well have heard in front of the grand jury what it is that he has to say. But if you want to have some sort of agreement, you know, either to not be prosecuted or be prosecuted for lesser crimes, part of the terms of that agreement would be, you know, you can't talk about this uh, until, you know, whatever point it becomes unsealed. Okay, so, so they can keep somebody quiet. Right, right. Again, not... They can't keep him quiet about what he testified to the grand jury about, but if he wanted to enter into a cooperation agreement, you, you could make that part of the terms. Okay, so if he is allowed to talk about what he testified to the grand jury about, but his cooperation agreement says you can't talk about it, does that mean he can't talk about what he testified I, to the grand I don't jury know. about? I mean, I, or is I, it I don't more like a? You can, I don't know if you can wait. I, I don't think the government would seek to, you know, or, or could have him waive his ability to talk about what he did or produced to the Maybe grand just jury. just ask but real nicely. I think, you know, sit there and be, <laughs> hey, as part of this uh, cooperation agreement, you know, we're going to agree to do one, two, three, four and not do five, six, seven, eight. In exchange, you're going to provide testimony about this in these different trials. You're not going to talk about it and, you know, the nature of it. So that you could do. So, and it's in, look, if he decides, and if this is the case, that there is some sort of cooperation agreement and the government asked him to keep it quiet, the spirit of it, they don't need to specify and you can't talk about what you said to the grand jury, right? I mean, the, the spirit right. of it is you're cooperating. Please don't talk about it. And, you know, maybe it's the case that Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona haven't asked him to to not do that. But uh, it's interesting, again, though, it just goes to show this one person, right, Chesbro and there are others, how they were all of these different state level crimes had a role in it. And it wasn't just Chesbro, right? I mean, it was all these folks, uh, you know, running around getting the plot together. So again, it always makes me think all the things that Jack Smith is doing that we just don't know about because nobody's out there talking about it. Right. And has Jack Smith talked to these state prosecutors and attorneys general and said, hey, I got the Rudys and the Sydneys and the the Chesbros of the world. Um, you guys get the fraudulent electors or, I mean, that doesn't seem like there would be that level of coordination. I know there wasn't in Georgia because Fonnie Willis said there wasn't, uh, because she, she went all the way up, right? Who knows? We have really no idea. Yeah. And that's interesting, you know, talk about Georgia. It's interesting because the, the potential witness list for the Georgia trial has been shared with reporters at the Atlanta journal constitution. And there, there are upwards of 200 people on it. This is from, uh, Tamar Hallerman. Among the names prosecutors have included on their almost 200-person witness list, former Vice President Mike Pence, ex-Attorney General Bill Barr, one-time Justice Department officials Jeffrey Rosen and Richard Donahue, U.S. Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, hmm. and Steve Bannon, the conservative provocateur and former aide 
to former President Donald Trump. Now, the district attorney's office could also call several of Georgia's top Republican leaders, including Governor Brian Kemp, Attorney General Chris Carr, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, and former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan. Cassidy Hutchinson is also on the list. For, now, when it comes to uh, the former Justice Department officials, Barr, Donahue, and Rosen, now they also testified before the January 6th Congressional Committee, just like Cassidy Hutchinson did. When it comes to the, the DOJ officials, that's Barr, Donahue, and Rosen, if they're going to testify, they're probably going to need approval from the Biden administration because an agency regulation says no current or former Justice Department employee may testify in response to a subpoena or court demand without obtaining prior approval by an appropriate department official. Yeah, I, I would not imagine DOJ <laughs> would block that and would not grant it. But, you know, it's a step that presumably they'll have to take uh, out of the DA's office before uh, they could go down and testify. Now, District Attorney, finally could also call two Republicans who refused to serve as Trump electors in Georgia after it became clear that Joe Biden had won the state. John Isaacson, the son of the late U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson, backed out of the December 14, 2020 meeting of GOP electors after deciding that the effort seemed like, quote, political gamesmanship, unquote. And then also on Willis's list is C.J. Pearson, a young conservative social media star who didn't serve as an elector because he moved to Alabama to attend college. Hmm. So not because it was wrong or anything that he had to go to college. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> never like, uh, I, I, I moved and so I couldn't. But it's, it, you know, 200, <laughs> that's a lot of witnesses. And again, it just goes to even if the trial gets underway when Fonnie Willis wants to do it, that's a ton of witnesses. And for, mm-hmm. a, for a group of jurors to keep track of all that information, I think... You know, while this trial may start before the election, it's going to be really interesting to me to see if it gets uh, if it's completed before the election. Yeah, she didn't seem to think so. She seemed to think it would had it go into 2025. Um, and of course, these are just potential witnesses. I don't necessarily mean they're going to doesn't necessarily mean they're going to call everybody. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it ends up uh, shaking out when we get uh, closer to trial and those witness lists become a little more uh, concrete. All right. Check this out. Pete, Jim Jordan, and Barry Loudermilk. That's the guy who gave tours of the Capitol tunnels mm. on January the 5th. Sconces, and- the, sc- the, the sconces <laughs> on the stairwells. And the sconces on the walls. Yeah, and he said at first, I was just a family of four. And then he was like, because people were like, well, some of them were wearing like MAGA hats. And he's like, well, it was a family of four and some of their friends. And they're like, yeah, but like it looked like literally like 19 people. And he was like, well, yeah, it was like 19 people. And sure, some of them had MAGA hats. And of course we were closed, but you know, it was just showing them the the wall decorations, the sconces and stuff. This is Barry Loudermilk, the guy who changed his fucking story a hundred times. Excuse me for swearing on the main episode. But anyway, Loudermilk and Jordan wrote another letter to DA Fonnie Willis demanding to know about her coordination with the January 6th committee, claiming they're investigating the collusion between the two uh, group, the two groups there, the, the, the district attorney's office and the January 6th select committee. And this is from NBC. The two GOP lawmakers said the investigation will focus on they're doing an investigation into this, by the way. And it will focus on communications between Willis's office and the now defunct January 6th committee, citing that they said what they said was a letter Willis sent to the panel's chairman, Rep. Benny Thompson, seeking access to recordings and transcripts of witness interviews and other record, uh, records. And she did that back in December of 2021. But as Anna Bauer, who we've had on this show before and is a gem, she said on Twitter, first, it's not unusual or improper for law enforcement to request documents from other government bodies. And two, it's been publicly known for a while now that Willis received some of the information from the January 6th committee directly. I mean, it's literally in their report. (laughs) There's no gotcha here. So that's happening and I haven't I haven't seen a return letter from Fonnie Willis yet. The last one she wrote, Jim Jordan, included a link to a book about the law so that you can read <laughs> up on it. Um, and so, I mean, just apps like it's the the weaponization of the weaponization committee or actually in this in this case, it's the, the judiciary and the House admin committee, which is what became of the defunct January 6th committee. It's just astounding. The hypocrisy is ridiculous and it's only going to get worse. They're going to vote this week to impeach Biden, which is stupid. They have no evidence. Everybody knows it. It's just a clown show. It's embarrassing. It's not. I think they know, Pete, they're going to lose the House 
pretty easily and pretty handily in 2024. So they're focusing all their energy on trying to get Trump reelected. I I don't know what's going on. I mean, the other thing is like Victor Orban is in town and apparently there are all oh. kinds of, uh, you know, who's, I think the Heritage Foundation is hosting him the maybe. The Heritage but all Foundation. Kinds, Zel- mm-hmm. Congressmen who are not willing to meet with Zelensky are bending over backwards to meet with this, you know, most authoritarian of our, you know, the NATO country members, because somehow that's that's acceptable. I mean, he has a blend of like authoritarianism that that appeals, but no, there, there's no serious. There, there, we don't have an aid package to Israel or Ukraine. We don't have a budget. We're still on a CR. There is no governance going on in the House of Representatives. It is entirely show theater to protect and advance uh, Donald Trump's uh, candidacy. I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, whether they're giving up on losing the House, I don't know. I mean, I will we'll see. I don't know if- uh, well, they're all re- retiring. I mean, 30 plus yeah, or well, something Republicans are like, like, peace out. The, and, and the quote unquote moderates are the ones leaving, right? I mean, it's the, the, the folks who at least were, you know, reasonable and you're getting more and more extreme and it's just the, you know, the, the circus, all you've got left are the clowns. So- Yeah. I, it's- I, I don't know. I'm not at all optimistic that, you know, and that's going to be the last thing before they break for the holidays, right? You know, get mm-hmm. get that going and then everybody jumps out of town until the new year. Yeah. And Biden's brought, brought everybody, the, like the senators back to the table to be like, all right, let's discuss what border policies you want to put into place. And and maybe maybe the effort is, all right, we'll put these terrible draconian border policies into place, but I'm not going to enforce them. Uh, and you know, you y'all will be out of here in less than a year. Well, a little over a year, I guess, because they they take over January third of twenty twenty five. The new Congress does. So I don't know. We'll see what ends up happening. And again, if if there is a bill passed and Biden signs it, it can the, it can go be sued. They can be sued for that legislation. It can go to court. It can be stayed. Those border policies. I mean, there's a lot of ways kind of around this, but nothing good. Um, and it's just so we can govern. And as as much as we laugh at it, it's it's a super bad look uh, for us globally, um, and it's very bad for national security, particularly not replenishing our own weapons stocks, which is what right. at least half of the money for Ukraine would be going toward. And so that's just terrible for national security. But I mean that fortunately, this particular uh, moment in history, this Congress, I think, will be relegated to two years and never heard from again. So <laughs> you're there's hoping. Uh, but you're right. The extremists will be there, but they will be outnumbered. They will be in the minority. Um, okay. We have to take another quick break. Uh, but speaking of Jim Jordan, our next guest recently testified before Jim's weaponization committee, and we'll speak to her after the break. Stick around. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Just a few more patrons to thank. We've got Lab Rat Mountain Biker, been here since the kitchen table days. Oh. Sarah Wilcher, Star Moon, Diane Doty, Navy Davy, and should have called it Amateur Say. Thank all of you so much for your support. Uh, you truly make this possible and make it possible for us to bring people in. Like today, as we head to the Hill, and joining us is former Vice President Pence's Homeland Security and counter-terrorism, counter-terrorism advisor, Olivia Troy. Olivia, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I've been waiting. I watched you and, and uh, on the Hill in testimony and was absolutely looking forward to talking to you about the experience of, we, we frequently talk about the Weaponization Committee and the House Judiciary Committee, but never have we had somebody who actually appeared before them. And I'm so curious to get your thoughts about that whole process. So how, so, so start at the beginning, how did you actually get, was, were you invited? Were you subpoenaed? How did you, how did you find yourself there? Yeah. So I was asked to uh, testify before the committee by representative Stacey Plaskett. She is the ranking Democrat on the committee. Uh, she uh, actually, they called like two days before the hearing was taking place. <laughs> and then I got the letter. <laughs> so it was a quick decision to do it like you all, I tracked that committee very closely. Um, so as you can imagine, I had not pictured myself sitting in front of it. And uh, there I was. But I felt that it was important to to just, you know, testify truthfully in an effort to, you know, if we're really going to get down to uh, the actual weaponization of the federal government, I figured I would provide some some details and facts about my experience seeing it actually weaponized 
Uh, but I don't I don't think that that's what Jim Jordan had envisioned for the for the <laughs> hearing. No, no, he he only wants to talk about how it's weaponized against them. But yeah, talk a little bit about that, um, your testimony and the, the the personal experience you have with the weaponization of the federal government. Yeah, so they, um, you know, it was Jim Jordan's focus, obviously, is he's uh, saying that conservatives are being centered on social media. That is the whole angle of this. They've got these conspiracies about uh, what happened in the election, and it's a whole thing. Um, so they bring in these uh, witnesses to testify. And uh, in my opening statement... I really said, yeah, this is a matter that should be taken very seriously. The weaponization of the federal government is a very serious issue. And if we're going to have a substantive conversation on this, then we should be talking about Donald Trump, who is currently, again, the likely to be the Republican nominee and candidate for the presidency, who I saw use the government against the people when he was actually in the Oval Office. And uh, you know, and so I, 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 I thought it was important uh, to get perspective on that. If we're going to be talking about that issue, then we should be talking about it truthfully on what's really at stake here and what really happened along the way. Do you ever feel, it, it seems like all of a sudden there have been a whole bunch of folks in the print media and broadcast media suddenly getting concerned about what Trump might do if reelected. And it feels like stop, you know, you don't need to speculate because there are all these people who he did plenty of horrible, bad things during his first administration. And this sudden like epiphany moment where people are saying, oh, hey, it might be really bad. It's like, well, why don't you go talk to the people who were there? Because it was bad. And this hypothetical, it's not a hypothetical thing. Do you get, I mean, it seems weird. Do you, do you ever get like a sense of not deja vu, but almost like how, how is it that people are just now discovering that this might be bad? Yeah, I, you know, I feel like I have been like chicken little yelling up into the sky for three years, except for the sky really did fell in the Trump administration, right? I mean, it was, it sort of is that feeling where I, I don't know how many of us have provided concrete examples, you know, and, and Allison, you asked, like, talk about examples. Well, during the hearing, I actually pointed to things. I said, you want to talk about weaponization of the federal government? Let's think about the fact when Trump withheld disaster relief based on the fact that states didn't vote for him, right? When he withheld relief, disaster relief for the California wildfires because they were a blue state. By the way, the only way that he was convinced to release those fire emergency management grants was when he was told that Orange County voted majorly in his favor. That is how he made the decision. Like you're not supposed, that's no politics should play in that when it comes to aiding for the American people in the aftermath of a disaster. And I talked about that. And the other thing I pointed out was, hey, those people in Florida, if you're impacted by a hurricane in the future and Trump should end up in the Oval Office again and he's pissed off at Ron DeSantis, it doesn't matter. He will take it out on you all. You all will be the feel the impacts of his revenge because he'll be so mad at the top that he'll withhold aid from you. I mean, that's weaponization. You know, we can talk about the Department of Justice. We can talk about disaster relief. We can talk about target targeted uh campaigns against media right where he was upset to me like for example he revoked the pass from jim acosta just for asking him hard questions in the press hearing like yeah i mean all of that is multiple layers of what donald trump is capable of and has already done right that is the thing like i i don't know how else to show concrete examples when all of these people that we've lived it you've lived it pete like we've seen this kind of play out so i I sit here and I'm, I'm just, I feel like I am repeating myself at times, but look, if it takes now, finally, because we're going into the election and it's what we're going during 24, 24 and people are like, oh, this could really happen. He could actually do this. I'm like, well, he did. And it'll be 10,000 <laughs> times worse if he comes back. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be worse. He's not going to just talk about the shooting the protesters, right? He's going to shoot them. He's going to have the military take them out. That's what yeah, he's already called for that. And, you know, I mean, everything is just always about him personally. Like you talk about that particular example. I remember when I interviewed Miles Taylor for his book, Blowback, and he talked about what he wanted, what Trump wanted to do to the VA. He was very angry that veterans got all this money. He wanted to gut that and put the money elsewhere, like a, toward, toward a wall or whatever, um, and or not give it to Ukraine. And, and 
you know, finally the thing that convinced him was everyone was like, if you mess with veterans, you won't get a second term. You will not be reelected. And that's when he that only then did he decide to not touch the Department of Veterans Affairs. But it was his plan to do so in the second term. And that's why this second term is uh, will he won't leave. So, you know, it's uh, he he weaponized the IRS against Andy McCabe. And I know I know that the inspector general found that that he didn't, but he obviously did. The odds of McCabe and Comey getting that kind of an audit are one in a they're insurmountable odds. Um, but there's just all sorts of weaponization going on. How did they respond to your testimony? I'm f- frankly surprised Jim Jordan let it happen or or was it sneaky and fast tracked? Like, how did they respond to your testimony? Yeah, Jim Jordan was interesting. He sort of glossed over it. Um, but then you had the others, uh, you know, Congressman Issa uh, said this hearing isn't about Trump. I actually kind of wanted to be like, well, but it is because actually you came to the White House and uh, you were in a meeting with Mike Pence where you were requesting that that relief be released. So I'm just giving you examples of things that you personally actually lived and witnessed. So that was the ironic part for me, right? Is that some of these people, these Republicans were felt the impacts, they made the phone calls, they were, you know, outraged at times with decisions that Trump was making that were hurting their own constituents. And yet there was like amnesia in the room where they didn't actually want to have that discussion because obviously that doesn't that doesn't fulfill what they're trying to do, which is use the sound bites, use it to fundraise and use it to say to say that yes, the government is uh, you know that deep state is after you. It's being used against the American people. Well, none of my narratives fit that because I was there as a national security person, and also you know I, I was a lifelong Republican. And I'll be honest, though, Jim Jordan did acknowledge that he did at some point in the hearing said, "What's the irony here when we've got a Republican testifying for a, as a Democrat witness?" as a Republican, which was kind of interesting. He didn't, he didn't defy it. You know, he didn't diffuse it or dispute the fact that I was, but I think it's just the facts are the facts. But the interesting part is that they didn't want to hear that. And like one of the representatives, um, man, she was out there. She was going off about whatever conspiracy on social media. And I finally stopped her and I said, look, you're right. I did call. I called a social media company once and I called them because there were pictures of a missionary that was killed, brutally killed in Africa. And so I called and we said, you know, we would like to request that you take these photos down while we notify his family in Indiana. It was a Republican state legislator that called the White House and said, my uh, brother has been killed and these photos are all over social media right now. Can you, I, I don't want his kids to see them. And, you know, all we did was put the request in though. Ultimately, it was up to them. Right. That's the thing. Like we it wasn't even a guarantee, just like it was with well, that, there was Republicans asking under a Republican well, administration. Ironic, right? It is. It was a Trump White House calling. It was me calling um, from the office. So um, but she did not want to hear me talk about that. So, you know, it was just sort of tunnel vision. Um, and I just tried to see the course. Um, but I have to tell you that the aftermath was ugly. Uh, and I think that that is what is so striking and I think dangerous about this type of committee and hearing is that the propaganda that they're pushing out works because I, I felt like I was back in September of 2020 when I came forward and went public. It got pretty bad the last couple of weeks after I testified. And I was like, wow, I just testified before Congress, before Jim Jordan. And the calls and the threats were so ugly. And it was the most racist, disgusting vitriol I have actually heard to date was after that, which to me was incredibly striking. And I think is probably the point. Right. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that. You mentioned that to to the uh, other witnesses that you unfortunately had to sit next to, uh, Matt Taibbi and uh, he's named Schellenberger, right? You mentioned right. something that they, like your fellow witnesses were putting out stuff after the testimony about you and what you said, right? Yeah. You know, I was shocked by that. They clipped it. They clipped things. They put them out of context. It was like a 12 second clip. And they had me talking in my opening statement where I said, instead of focusing on conspiracies, we should be focused on the real threat. And then I talked about the threat of, of another Donald Trump presidency and what happened. And 
Um, and then they clipped it to later on when I was asked about a court case and I said, I did not call. I was referring to the actual court case and the court because I just don't disparage the justice system like many others do because I don't believe in that. I think it's 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 just not, uh, I don't think it's actually good for the wealth of the, demo- like health of the democracy to do that. Um, and I said, I didn't call that a conspiracy, but of course they clipped it out of context and they had that clip and it went everywhere. Um, the messages parrot everything that was said in the hearing though. I've got to tell you, I, I the phone calls I got and the voicemails, uh, messages on social media parroted a lot of what those witnesses said and what Jim Jordan, what Rep Massey said, almost verbatim. By the way, I was told that I, I am personally censuring them. They told me to stop censuring them. They told me that I'm in it with Stanford University. Um, I personally have apparently some superpower where I'm actually blocking all of you personally on Facebook. I don't know if you knew this, but I but I have this superpower where I can just, <laughs> that's the kind of thing. But uh, you know, I say the racist thing because in the hearing I said, um, we talked about the uh, we talked about the travel ban during the Trump administration, and I talked about being the head of Intel for it, and how hard it was um, because they went out of their way to override the intelligence assessments because it didn't fit their narrative, and they didn't. You know, Stephen Miller wanted a set list of countries, and it just wasn't it, it. It wasn't it wasn't what it was what he wanted it to be, right? And I talked about that. Uh, we talked about you know, anti-immigrant speech, hate speech, and what it leads to. And I talked about attacks like shootings of what it leads to and how vitriol like that on social media and violence, um, and how it kind of uh, plays out, the rhetoric of Trump. Uh, we talked about that. I actually mentioned that I was a daughter of a Mexican immigrant. Wow. Uh, I, uh, I guess I, I put myself blowback. on the record. On social it was media. Yeah. nasty. Um it was really ugly. I have uh, a lot of messages telling me to go back to Mexico. But all these immigration narratives that you're hearing where they're not, you know, uh, birthright citizenship here in the U.S., all of the things that you hear in these sort of anti-immigrant Republican narratives about immigration, all of this stuff, all of that actually was mixed. It became like this mixed cocktail in the messages I was getting. It was it was like, you're censoring, you're daughter of illegals you are affirmative action that's the only reason you went to college that money went to you instead of me i mean it was literally every single talking point that you could have put out there was combined yeah, i saw the messages. deport you because of they should take away birthright citizenship or yeah. I mean, like all of it yeah uh, by the way i was born in nevada but that's okay i think they, they, they still <laughs> think matter. that they can deport me it doesn't matter it was funny. I heard somebody was commenting. They said, it's not that for the average Trump voter, it is not so much that they like Trump. It is that Trump hates the same people they hate and that it somehow gets, you know, it, it like creates a permission to say these things, to feel these things, to express them and, you know, just this hateful stuff. And so, you know, I, I, I don't know if I entirely believe it because I do think there's some people out there who who like him just for, for you know, all the hatred that he espouses. But it is so sad to hear that you know, just the, the immediate response and how fast and how significant it is just immediately after appearing. Because, I mean, again, it was, you know, yeah, it was on C-SPAN and yes, it was on the news, but it wasn't like, you know, when, you know, somebody like the initial, some huge build up to a panel that everybody's tuning in for. I mean, is isn't, you know, the vote to expel Santos, for example, that's, you know, covered live. It was not that, but still to have such a huge response. And that was happening the same day, by the way. So, <laughs> did you, did you see? There. Did you did you see something? No. I was leaving them. <laughs> no, I just saw people. I, I saw Lee Stefanik running in, very stressed out, in and out, in and out. That's what I saw. Yes. Oh, and I wanted to ask you before we let you go, because you know we only have a limited amount of time on here. But uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about George Santos because this is our this is our congressional block. Um, there's some breaking news that the DOJ was interested in moving his trial from September of next year to May of next year, and then they also said that they want an extra 30 days because they're actually in talks for a cooperation, for a plea agreement um, to resolve this before trial. What, what I'm interested in your thoughts on that because I know you're following it closely. Yeah. I mean, look, George Santos is, is toast, right? I mean, uh, that, that's probably the only reason he got expelled is because they don't need to draw him, especially in an election year. So 
I yeah, think we were hoping he would stay so we could use him as you a cudgel against that. the Republican yeah. Party. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they and they saw that, right? They saw that as a play, and they're like, "This is toxic. It's a miracle." Like, right. they can't seem to do that with Trump, though. But, um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> here we are. So, um, look, good riddance. We don't need people like him in Congress. There's certainly plenty of others that are still hanging on. I mean, look at Matt Gates; he's still in there, and he managed to oust uh, Kevin McCarthy not only from the speakership, but he managed to oust him out of Congress itself. From so. the House, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, and I can't wait to see when he leaves, and then the uh, who's the other his little henchman who had the gavel and the pro tem uh, speaker Mick. who's also leaving, right? So it's uh, that majority is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, the the speaker pro tem McHenry was that his McHenry. name? McHenry. Yeah, yeah. this little angry gavel, and then Bill Johnson also is is out. They're going to have a one vote margin. And and our final thing we were going to talk to uh, talk to you about today is that the the ethics committee is now calling witnesses or at least a witness in the Matt Gates ethics investigation the same investigation that did not result in any criminal charges uh, out of uh, out of the DOJ but um, it looks like the ethics um, thing is going forward and it'll be interesting to see when the ethics committee reports on this. They use that as due process to oust Santos, but I guarantee you they will not expel their single remaining vote that keeps them in the majority, even if they went through the same due process and found terrible crimes. Well, that would be doing the right thing and the right thing for the country. <laughs> and uh, we have seen that retaining power over anything else is what matters to a lot of these people, unfortunately. Um, so I don't, yeah, look, I don't, I, I don't actually see much action taking place against Matt Gates, even though I do think that there is a lot there. Uh, underneath the surface that we I think we've only scratched the surface on that one but um, he is an awful human being yeah they may not even release the report to be <laughs> to be honest uh, just to, to so that they don't have to vote on it or be forced into boxing to vote on it all right thank you so much uh, we really appreciate you uh, hanging out coming here telling us about your experience um, testifying before the Jim Jordan Weaponization Committee, um, I everybody we're gonna I'm gonna be talking um, with Olivia on the Daily Beans uh, next week, and we're gonna air that during the Christmas holiday week. And I'm really looking forward to speaking to you a little bit more about this and going a little more in depth. But thank you so much, and thank you to all of our listeners. Thanks to our patrons. Um, we will see you next week. We really appreciate you listening to this podcast. Uh, I've been Allison Gill, and I'm Pete Struck. We'll see you next week. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.